In this lesson, I want us to talk about the doctrine of eternal security. We've been going through a study of the doctrine of salvation, uh, what theologians call soteriology, for many, many months now. And as we come toward the end of this series, we want to address a an important subject that really draws on everything we've been saying from God's Word about the meaning of grace, the meaning of the gospel, the meaning of salvation, the meaning of faith, what is saving faith. Everything we've been talking about sort of comes together under this crucial topic of eternal security. So we're going to do part one uh, this week. We will spend two weeks on this doctrine, and then we'll pick up uh, part two next week. Um, but to begin this study, I want to kind of start at the macro level and talk about three views on eternal security. Uh, the first view on this doctrine is an explicit denial of the doctrine of eternal security. Many people within Christianity, even within conservative evangelicalism, uh, hold to the explicit denial of eternal security. That is to say, they do not believe in eternal security security. Uh, they think salvation can, in fact, be lost. And uh, when I say, by the way, even within conservative Christianity, uh, keep in mind what we mean by distinguishing conservative versus liberal. When you talk about liberal theology or liberal Christianity, you're talking about people who deny the authority of God's Word. Uh, they think the Bible is just good literature. They don't believe in fundamentals of the faith, such as the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the inerrancy of Scripture, those kinds of things. That's liberal theologians. And frankly, they don't really even have a doctrinal framework because they don't even believe the Bible. But within those uh, and among those who hold that the Bible is the only authority for our beliefs, attitudes, and practices, they love the Lord Jesus. They love His Word. They teach the Word of God. Even among those, there are some who believe in the doctrine of eternal security, and there are those that don't believe in the doctrine of eternal security. So we want to be careful when criticizing those who may disagree with us. Uh, in, we want to be careful to, uh, to avoid personal attacks and make it sound like, oh, because they don't agree on this doctrine that somehow they're bad people. Uh, no, they're not bad people. Uh, they're good people in many cases. They love the Lord, but they're just wrong. And it is an important doctrine. I don't mean to minimize it. I don't think we can all just say, oh, whatever will be, will be. You say potato, I say potato. It uh, doesn't really matter. No, it matters crucially. It is fundamental to the whole issue. And in fact, as we're going to see, those who don't believe in eternal security, it's always because they have a different way of handling Scripture. They connect the dots differently. And at the end of the day, it comes down to they don't understand the meaning of grace. Because if you understand the meaning of grace... Then you will and you interpret the Bible in its literal, grammatical, historical perspective, you will necessarily arrive at uh, the defense of the belief of the doctrine of eternal security. So the first view that you need to put out there is uh, the view that, in fact, salvation can be lost. In this view, they explicitly deny the doctrine of eternal security. But then there's a second view that I call the effective denial. The effective denial of the doctrine of eternal security. Uh, and this is the view that salvation can never be lost, but it can be disproved or it can be invalidated. Now, we've talked a lot about this in uh, uh, months gone by as we talked about the Reformed view on the doctrine of salvation. Uh, so let's review just briefly here. Remember, we said the Reformed view on the gospel is that those who get saved must, absolutely must, persevere in good works in order to prove that their salvation is valid. And if they don't persevere in good works, then they, in their view, teach that that person's faith was spurious and therefore they are not really saved. They're going to hell. So in this case, in, in the second view on eternal security, these folks would never say you can lose your salvation. But they would say, very emphatically, and they've written book after book on the subject, they would say that you can uh, prove that someone never really had it to begin with. So in both cases of these first two views, one's good works become instrumental and non-negotiable in order for them to get to heaven. In the first case, 
If you don't do good works or if you do something really bad, God takes your salvation away from you and you end up in hell. In the second view, if you don't do good works or don't do them consistently enough to meet whatever the arbitrary standard is of the person writing the book, we talked a lot about that, um, or if you do particularly bad works of carnality for an unspecified length of time in that case, then that proves you never really had salvation to begin with and you end up in hell. So in each case, these are denials, in my uh, opinion, of the doctrine of eternal security. Because when you get right down to it, what's the difference between saying you must do consistent good works or you will lose your salvation and saying you must do consistent good works or you never really had salvation? Either way, good works become the determinative factor in one's eternal destiny. And as we've said uh, repeatedly and as the scripture clearly demonstrates, grace is not of works. Works and grace don't go together. Our eternal destiny has no relationship to our good works. We've talked a lot about how uh, good works are the natural response and outflow of a new life in Christ, that once someone is part of the family of God, they will naturally want to stay in fellowship with God, that the Spirit of God indwelling within man will naturally produce fruit. That's the normal, healthy response of a believer as we walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh, as we walk by faith and not by sight, as we keep our eyes fixed on the Lord and we stay in His Word and we live out the new man that's within us, as we reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, as we remember the words of Paul in Galatians 2.20 that we are crucified with Christ Nevertheless, we live, yet it's not I, but Christ lives in us. And the life we now live, we live by faith. As we remember those principles, then, of course, we're going to produce a, a lifetime of spiritual fruit and godliness and righteous behavior. However, we have the sin nature still to do battle with, as Paul describes so eloquently in Romans chapter 6 through 8, particularly chapter 7. And a believer who caters to the flesh, to that sin nature, is capable of living in prolonged states of carnality. And so we can never look at someone whose life is characterized by sinfulness, and yet they know the Lord, or say they know the Lord. We can never look at them and say, oh, you don't really know the Lord. Your faith has been disproven. Your salvation has been invalidated. You're really going to hell because your life isn't producing good works. We can never do that because it's possible for a believer to commit heinous sins if they cater to the flesh. In fact, I've often said there's no sin that an unbeliever can commit that a believer cannot also commit if he's catering to the flesh. Now again, that's not normal, it's not healthy, and it's certainly not good. There is nothing good about sin. There's nothing acceptable about sin. Sin, bad. Godliness, good. I want to go on record saying that I'm against sin. Let's be clear. But the minute we make sinful behavior or the absence of godly behavior the determinative factor about who gets in and who doesn't, we have denied the doctrine of eternal security. Why? Because the doctrine of eternal security, which is the third view here, an explicit defense of this view, simply says salvation can never be lost. Period. No qualifications, no ifs, ands, or buts. Salvation can never be lost. That is, once a person is saved, by definition, as we're going to see, salvation can never be lost. Why? Because we're talking here about eternal salvation. That's why we call this eternal security. Remember, we've, we've touched on the fact that the term salvation can mean a variety of things uh, in Scripture. It can mean temporal salvation. It can mean deliverance into the kingdom, deliverance out of trouble, deliverance from sickness or illness. But in Scripture, it can also mean eternal salvation. That is, passing from death to life, having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, becoming part of the family of God, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, being justified, declared positionally righteous before a holy God, so that you are now a citizen of heaven. And once that happens, and we've spent months talking about how that happens, hopefully that's clear by now, that salvation is by grace through faith. When faith meets the right object, the result is regeneration every time. Faith alone in Christ alone, the only one who can save you, brings new life every time. And once that has happened, at that moment, salvation can never be lost. Nothing that happens on a linear timeline after that punctiliar moment in time when you gave uh, 
you know, trusted Christ, gave uh, your faith, placed your faith and trust in Him, when you came to that decision where one second earlier you were not trusting in Christ, you were lost in dead in your trespasses and sins on the road to hell, but in that moment you trusted of your own free will in exclusively Jesus Christ as the only one who can save you, and you acknowledge that He is the Son of God who died and rose again for your sins, took your place on the cross, and now He and He alone can save you. When you made that decision, when you came to that point in your life and trusted Him, from that point on, on a linear timeline, nothing that happens, externally or internally, can change your spiritual DNA. That's the doctrine of eternal security. So three views. Some people just explicitly deny it. Just make no bones about it. I don't believe in it. You can lose it. Uh, and there are varying degrees of that. I mean, uh, uh, some Arminians, uh, you know, which is this, that's the view of Arminianism that you have to work for your salvation. They would say that it's only in rare cases where you totally deny the Lord that you would forfeit your salvation. They would say you don't forfeit it just by every little sin here and there. And then on the other extreme, some people would say, oh, every time you do the slightest sin, you've got to get resaved. So there's a continuum, but they're all wrong uh, because they all deny this important doctrine of eternal security. Then the second view is the effective denial. That is, they would certainly affirm with their mouth the doctrine of eternal security. Uh, Calvinists uh, often are confused as being, uh, you know, people often confuse Calvinists as basically being those who hold to eternal security. In other words, uh, let me say that another way. Because I passionately believe the doctrine of eternal security, because I think the Bible teaches that, I've been accused of being a Calvinist. Of course, you know, those who follow my teaching and our ministry know that I'm anything but. I've written and taught uh, on the radio and other places extensively against the, the, the five points of Calvinism as they're commonly understood. So Calvinism is not a synonym for believing in the doctrine of eternal security. But many people assume they do believe in it because they think the fifth point of Calvinism, the P, perseverance of the saints, is synonymous with eternal security. But as I've shown during our overview of Calvinism in this series uh, several weeks ago, the P in, in, in the five points of Calvinism, TULIP, the perseverance of the saints does not mean uh, that you believe in eternal security. It means that they believe you will persevere in good works. And if you persevere in good works, then yes, you are eternally secure. But you cannot know the future. You cannot know whether you will persevere in good works. And that's why R.C. Sproul, for example, has said that he can only be 99% sure he's going to heaven because he knows, according to his theology, that he can't tell the future. And even though he's pretty sure he's going to walk with Christ until he dies, he might on his deathbed deny the Lord, which in his view would disprove or invalidate his faith and prove that he never was saved to begin with. So that's the effective denial of salvation, of eternal security. And then finally, the view that we're going to be uh, promoting in this uh, two-part series uh, is the, an explicit defense from Scripture on the doctrine of eternal security, which is that salvation can never be lost. So we need to remember that Satan's primary goal is to keep the lost lost and the saved defeated. Let me say that again. Satan's primary goal is to keep the lost lost and the saved defeated. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he can accomplish both tasks with one main weapon. If you think of the cosmic struggle and the battlefields on one battlefront, he's got all of the believers that he's focused on, trying to defeat them and discourage them and keep them out of play. And then on the other battlefield, he's got all the lost people, and he's trying to blind them to the gospel, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and keep them from hearing the gospel and keep them lost. Well, on both battlefronts, he has the same weapon, which is a faulty or unclear gospel message. And the reason so many people reject the doctrine of eternal security is because Satan has created an enormous amount of confusion when it comes to the gospel of grace. Once you have a clear understanding of the gospel message from Scripture, once you understand the biblical teaching on grace, then the doctrine of eternal security flows easily and without question. But if you don't understand grace, then you're going to have a hard time accepting the doctrine of eternal security. I've had this discussion literally thousands of times in 25 plus years of ministry, 28 years of ministry now. 
literally thousands of times, talking to people about the gospel. And the pride of men and women is so strong that they just feel like they have to do something. So they'll say things like, you mean a person can do anything they want and still go to heaven? I'll say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't recommend it. God's given us a blueprint for living and it usually goes pretty well when we follow his word and we're blessed. And James very clearly says the person who's a doer of the word, not just a hearer, he's going to be blessed in his life. So I don't know why you would want to do anything you want, but yeah, absolutely. That's the essence of grace. We don't get to heaven based on what we do. We get to heaven based on what Christ did on our behalf. And it's a free gift. That's what a gift is. It's free. It comes with no strings attached. The minute you attach strings to it, it's no longer a gift. It's an obligation. It's an agreement. It's an arrangement. And uh, salvation is not an arrangement. It's a, not a bilateral contract. It's a unilateral gift from the creator of the universe whose son and our savior shed his blood on our behalf. See, Christ didn't have to shed his blood if somehow we could earn or keep our salvation through our own merit. And so people just really struggle with this doctrine. They say, it just doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't seem right. You can't tell me that a person can go out and murder. You know, they'll usually go immediately to the big sins. You can't tell me that a person can commit murder and still go to heaven. Well, I don't know. Look at the Apostle Paul. right? Look at David. Let's use David. He was already a believer after when he committed his murder. Um, of course you can that's the, the nature of grace. Paul says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You can't out-sin God's grace. Now, if a person's never been saved, if they've never trusted Christ and Him alone for salvation, then uh, certainly any sin, even the littlest of sin, separates them from God. Uh, that's why James says even if you keep the whole law but stumble in the smallest point, you're guilty of all, and we're born sinners. <laughs> so our sin separates us from God. But Christ's righteousness restores us with God. And we have that right relationship as we're reconciled to him by faith. And nothing we can do can destroy our family relationship. It might injure our uh, fellowship with the Lord, but it's not going to change who we are in Christ, our position in Christ. So people really struggle with this, this whole concept because they, they have a misconception about salvation to begin with. And, you know, some people, as I said, right from the beginning, they, they think they have, you have to earn it. You know, a lot of Roman Catholics, for example, think that salvation is something you earn through the seven sacraments or through this list of do's and don'ts or whatnot. Um, but it doesn't matter how much performance you include in the equation. If it's 50-50 or 99-1, it still is not grace because grace is 100% God and 0% man. So Paul put it this way in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. So when the gospel is unclear, the lost stay lost, the saved stay defeated, and people live their lives wallowing around in doubt, wondering, am I really saved? Because they don't understand the doctrine of eternal security. Again, Paul says that Satan is blinding men's hearts to the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says the message of the cross is, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We get it. We understand. See, once you get a hold of grace, it changes your whole life. It changes your motivation for living. It changes, you know, why you do what you do every day, why you get out of bed. You begin, to, you, you quit looking over your shoulder for the other shoe to drop and you begin understanding God loves you and he wants what's best for you. Do you make mistakes? Absolutely. Do you fall short? Absolutely. Do you learn from those mistakes? Hopefully. Hopefully you do. But it doesn't, it's, it's not ever a question of where am I going to spend eternity. It's just like my children. They sometimes do things that makes dad angry. And they have to face the discipline for the consequences of what they've done. And, and they know I can get angry. But they never doubt for a second that they're my son or they're my daughter. Because they're part of my family. And uh, the same thing is true in our spiritual DNA. So the reason the doctrine of eternal security is not embraced by all is because there's an underlying confusion. And this is why I said this doctrine at the outset of today's message, it really coalesces all of everything else we've been talking about in the doctrine of salvation. Um, because if you don't understand, for example, the distinction between salvation and discipleship, you're not going to understand eternal security. If you think that somehow your entrance into heaven is based on your ability to follow Christ, you're going you're gonna to misunderstand the doctrine of eternal security. 
But if you understand that salvation is a free gift, discipleship is a matter of cooperating with the Holy Spirit and, and doing, you know, putting your hand to the plow and not looking back, counting the cost, dying to self, those kinds of things. But if you confuse the two and you think that the way a person gets into heaven to begin with is by self-denial, uh, surrendering uh, to the Lord, uh, then you're going you're gonna to be confused about the doctrine of eternal security. No one gets to heaven because they surrender to the Lord or commit their life to the Lord. They get saved because they receive the free gift of salvation by faith. Then, as a newborn babe in Christ, they can begin to surrender their life and commit their life and live their life for Christ. People are confused about justification versus sanctification, that first tense salvation versus the second tense salvation. Remember we talked about the three tenses of salvation? Salvation in the past, once for all, from the penalty of sin, when you trust Christ and Him alone for salvation. That's called justification, positional righteousness. Salvation in the present, which is where we are being saved, ongoing, day by day, from the power of sin as we yield to the Holy Spirit and walk by faith. That's what the Bible calls sanctification, or practical righteousness. And then there's a future salvation that we all look forward to someday, when we will be once for all saved from the very presence of sin, in glory. It's what the Bible calls glorification, when we leave this earth and, and, and enter into the new heavens and the new earth and the eternal dwelling place of the redeemed, and we have perfect righteousness once for all. We're no longer even in the presence of sin. But when people confuse those first two, justification and sanctification, they're going to have a hard time understanding the doctrine of eternal security. And then another way to put this is the distinction between the family of God and fellowship with God. When people are confused about the difference between being in the family of God, which happens by faith, or it's called justification, versus walking in fellowship with the Lord, and believers can walk in and out of fellowship. They can walk in and out of the light. Uh, you know, be, We should walk in the light as He is in the light and have fellowship with one another, John says in 1 John 1. But when you, under, when you confuse these underlying principles, then you're not going to understand eternal security. Now, what I want to do is I want to begin getting into what I list as eight undeniable proofs of eternal security. And as always, don't take my word for it. We're going to look at a lot of Scripture, and I want you to dissect each one of these eight. We'll get through the first few of them uh, here today, and then we'll pick up and do the rest of them in part two. But eight undeniable proofs of eternal security. The first one is logical proof. Logical proof. It's very simple. Eternal means eternal. In Greek, eternal means eternal. In Hebrew, eternal means eternal. In English, eternal means eternal. Eternal life is a present possession. This is so important to understand. Uh, it's a subtle thing that people misunderstand. Eternal life is not something you get when you die. Eternal life is something you get when you believe the gospel. See, if we got eternal life when we died, then it might make sense that you'd have to wait till you die to find out, do you really have it? But you don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life when you believe the gospel. So every child of God listening to my voice today has present possession, eternal life. You, you got it the moment you trusted in Christ. Therefore, if eternal life could somehow be lost, logically, it was never eternal to begin with. So as people have often said, if eternal life could be lost, it's got the worst name Jesus could ever give it in all of Scripture. I mean, eternal means eternal, just logically. When you got saved, you didn't get the possibility of eternal life. You got eternal life. You did not get the prospect of eternal life. You got eternal life. When you believed the gospel, you didn't get the, you know, the possibility, the, the hope, uh, you know, the potential. You got right then and there as a present possession transferred from the Lord Jesus himself who has the power to give it to you, who purchased it with his own blood. He gives that life to whoever he will, John tells us. You received right then eternal life. So how can someone who has in their possession, who owns eternal life, ever not have eternal life? It just doesn't logically make sense. Let's look at some passages of Scripture to kind of bolster this first uh, proof, what I call logical proof. Uh, Jesus said in John 5, 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has 
present tense, everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. It does not say probably won't come into judgment. It doesn't say possibly won't come into judgment. It doesn't say most likely won't come into judgment. There is no asterisk there where you read at the bottom of the page and it says, unless that is you live a prolonged life of carnality, or unless that is you deny the faith, or unless that is, there's no, there's no asterisk. It's emphatic and unequivocal. Shall not come into judgment. Why? Because you have passed the moment of faith from death to life. So you know, once you are spiritually alive, you have eternal life. You may die physically, but you cannot die spiritually. Jesus said in John 6, 47, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has, present tense, everlasting life. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We're going to come back to that verse at least one more time. Uh, throughout this study. It's a key proof text for the doctrine of eternal security. So do you understand what I mean by logical proof? By its very nature, the very nature of eternal life demands security. Because if, if, it's, if it can be lost, if it's in question or if it's in limbo somehow, then it's not eternal. So logical proof. Next, I want to look at biblical proof. And by that, I mean uh, you know, an exposition of certain key proof texts. And these would be good to commit to memory. Many of you probably already have these committed to memory. As If someone says, what, you know, where does the Bible teach eternal security? You should be able to rattle these off, uh, just like you should be able to on a number of key doctrines. Where does the Bible teach you know, the rapture? Where does the Bible teach you know, the deity of Christ and so forth? Well, these are some key biblical proof texts. So this is biblical proof. I always like to go to Ephesians chapter 1 first. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, where we read, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So here's the, here's the process. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Paul says you heard the gospel, you trusted in the gospel. And then notice what happens. In, him, in whom also, having believed, since you've believed in Christ, the good news about Christ, that he died and rose again for our sins, since you believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, to me, that can't get any more clear. It just can't get any more clear. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit to guarantee until the redemption of the purchased possession. Remember, we are redeemed by the blood of the lamb that's what it means by purchased possession so we now belong to the lord you know we're believers we're, we're part of the family of god and and that purchased possession will one day be redeemed in that future tense salvation glorification when this mortal puts on the mortality when this corruptible puts on incorruption and we're changed and we spend eternity in the presence of our lord but until then the holy spirit is our seal our guarantee that that will happen we're going to look at some exegetical proof a little bit later um, where we see exegetically, looking at the Greek grammar and syntax, that clearly the text says that our glorification in Romans 8 is as certain as our justification. In other words, when you believe the gospel, you are justified and glorified at the same time, even though we're not actually walking around in our glorified bodies yet. So Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 is a great biblical proof text. Uh, some others that talk about the sealing of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So what does it mean to be sealed? Well, apparently, if, if you don't believe in eternal security, then somehow you think that seal can be broken and that the guarantee has an exception clause. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we see another proof text here uh, where Paul says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us is God and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. See, in other words, if in fact we could be lost after being saved, then the spirit would have to come and go. But we believe and the Bible teaches that the spirit is permanently indwelling believers. He takes up presence permanently. He doesn't come and go. That's one of the blessings of the new 
uh, uh, covenant uh, and, and the blessings of the present church age as well. It's a foreshadowing, a taste of what's to come when the time shall be no more. And then John 10, 28, again, we mentioned this one earlier, is a great proof text where Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, I've heard this passage, that, again, it seems so clear just at face value. If you just read it in the plain, normal sense, there's no way. I mean, this one passage alone should settle the issue of eternal security. And yet I've heard people who deny the doctrine of eternal security say, well, no one can snatch you out, but you can jump out. <laughs> That's what they say. You can jump out. But again, even if that rather humorous explanation of this passage were true, it does not deal with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit, the permanent sealing of the Holy Spirit, the permanent being part of the family of God, the logical nature of the term eternal. None of that is answered by that uh, supposed a solution to this problem for those who deny eternal security. John 10, 28, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. In Greek, it's actually a double negative. They shall no, never perish. A friend of mine has written, I think, one of the definitive works on the doctrine of eternal security, Dennis Roxer, and the title of the book, in keeping with the grammar here, is shall never perish forever. <laughs> now, you shouldn't have to say never forever, but but that's the, the force of the Greek here. They shall never perish forever. Shall no, never perish it couldn't be more clear. And then finally, the last uh, proof text that I want to mention, and then we'll uh, close out for today, is Romans chapter 8. Another very passionate you know, passage from the Apostle Paul defending the certainty of our salvation. Uh, let's pick it up beginning in, uh, at the beginning of the passage there. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, peril or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now here it is, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. It just doesn't get any clearer than that. Now, before we close for today, let me just mention, I don't have it on the screen, but many people, going back to John 10, 28, because I always want to try to be fair to those who disagree uh, with me, with me and Jesus in this case. <laughs> um, you know, they will say, well, you know, yeah, you, you can't lose your salvation except in only one way, and that is if you deny the faith. Well, remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. That is such a crucial passage that answers that objection because it reminds us that we are part of the family of God. So even if we were to drift so far away from the Lord that in our despair we deny the Lord, Paul says God is faithful. He can't deny you because you're his own child. You're, you're a child of God. And we're going to talk about that familial, what I call familial proof next week. Well, let's pray. Then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dick and he can uh, take some uh, Q&A uh, there with you live uh, in the sanctuary. Father, we thank you again for this reminder of your grace. And Lord, we thank you that we don't have to hold on to it. We don't have to worry about it slipping away, that you paid a high price and that high price makes us secure. So we can rest assured in who we are in Christ and where we're heading. And Lord, I pray that if there's one here today within the sound of my voice, whether listening by video or watching uh, this in uh, the sanctuary, I pray if there's one who is doubting, who isn't sure, who has grown up under an environment that has taught them to doubt their salvation every time they blow it, I pray that today they would come to grips with the reality of how much God loves them and how secure they are and that they would walk in that security 
uh, and live out the new life in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>